All right, welcome uh, everyone. Thank you for coming. Welcome to our viewers at home as well. Uh, I am delighted to welcome uh, Fred Hogberg, who will, uh, in a few minutes, introduce his uh, his book. Trade is not a four letter word. Um, he'll do his presentation. Uh, the book cover is right behind me, and the book is for sale right outside the hallway. In case you're interested and have not read the book yet, um, after. Uh, Fred gives his uh, introduction. We'll have a panel conversation here uh, with uh, Greg Ipp of the Wall Street Journal, uh, Damon Silvers of the AFL-CIO, and my colleague, uh, Carlin Bowman, who's, who has graciously and kindly uh, agreed to step in for Emily Eakins, who was supposed to be here but couldn't uh, join us in the end. Um, I look forward to this. After we have our uh, discussion, we'll do Q&A uh, you know, with the audience. Um, I strongly recommend you buy the book. Uh, most books these days about uh, public policy or about politics are either uh, extremely uh, pessimistic or extremely angry. Uh, this one's actually kind of upbeat and you know, happy, optimistic. It's, very, it's a very good change in tone. A lot of talk about tacos and avocados. So, uh, so yeah, so buy it. It'll, you know, it's escapism without fully escaping. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it uh, you know, gives us a sense of a better uh, possible world out there. Anyway, with that, uh, uh, Fred uh, uh, Hugber is the former um, chairman and president of the Export-Import Bank, 2009, 2017. Um, and um, I am very glad he's here. Fred, you want to uh, take it away? First of all, I never thought I'd hear the word, I'm very glad you're here, to the chairman, former chairman of the Export Impulse Bank at the American Enterprise Institute. <laughs> that is almost an oxymoron to begin with. Um, this is my first time ever being, got a pass to get into this building, let alone speak here. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite, uh, uh, I was excited by the opportunity. And I want to thank a very old friend, longstanding, not old friend, Norm Ornstein, who, um, uh, helped usher, the, usher this all in. Um, and uh, so I'm going to make a few comments about the book, and, um, and I will leave this up here just to intrigue you for a moment why there's an avocado sitting on the, on the podium, on the lectern. Um, and actually, I thought I would, I'm not going to read anything, but I'll read you only one thing at the, in the epilogue of the book. Uh, question, true or false, free trade with foreign countries is good for America, because it opens up new markets and we cannot avoid the fact that it is a global economy. True or false? Well, actually, two-thirds of Americans, both Republicans and Democrats, agree with you on that. So um, I chaired the Export Input Bank for eight years. Uh, as Dan mentioned, longest serving. Um, I think of myself as also the long-suffering chairman of the Export Input Bank, uh, since we had quite a number of ordeals, uh, particularly uh, a lapse of five months and four days, I did count them, um, when we were not uh, authorized. And I'm actually pleased, though, this is not a talk about the Export Input Bank. Um, it now has a seven-year, quote-unquote, lease on life. Um, the only problem, the only challenge is when Congress does reauthorize an agency, the uh, start time is when the it last expired. So it's like when you get into a taxi, and then you, then you hit a traffic jam, and you sit there for 10 minutes, and the meter keeps running, and you haven't moved. So it's a little bit like that with an authorization as well. So um, I don't have to show the book. It's right here. So trade is not a full-letter word. Uh, arose out of my time at the Export Input Bank, and just looking and watching and hearing how the consensus on trade and export and engaging with the rest of the world kept declining over time. And um, so I took a look at that, and I traced it through uh, six products. And I'll talk a little bit about the products. Um, and the six products are, I started with actually the Taco Bowl, um, uh, which uh, President Trump uh, made uh, famous, I would say, during his campaign in 2016. Um, and I can share with you, I wanted to put the photograph of Donald Trump enjoying his Taco Bowl from Trump Tower Grill, but we could not find the photographer of that particular photograph. We were able to reproduce the tweet, but not the photograph. So um, that's why that's missing there. And of course, by the way, the Taco Bowl was not even invented in Mexico, has very little to do with Mexico. Um, Taco Bowl was 
um, invented by a man named C. Elmer Doolin, not a very Mexican name. Uh, he was traveling in Texas, uh, met a man from Mexico who had a uh, fryer that fried essentially like Doritos or Fritos. And um, he bought the patent from uh, um, Gustavo Alguin and brought it back to, of all places, Disneyland, where, of course, all foreign things are invented, and invented the taco bowl uh, at Disneyland. By the way, taco bowls is not dissimilar to chop suey, also invented in America. Corned beef and cabbage, also invented in America. Um, and all the ingredients of a taco bowl actually are a story about trade. And number one, uh, exhibit A would be the avocado. Anybody have guacamole over a Super Bowl weekend? 140 million pounds of avocados were smashed to smithereens on Super Bowl Sunday to provide avocados. We now import 85% of the avocados. They hardly were seen in this country before NAFTA. So NAFTA opened up the ability to import and trade in fruits and vegetables with Mexico. And so in sort, if you enjoyed an avocado or had avocados host today, part of that is because of trade. Um, we consume more beef than we produce. Uh, even the corn in a taco bowl or the corn we consume uh, does not come from Iowa. I was out in Iowa. They were very disappointed to hear it's not their corn. Most of the corn we eat in this country either comes from the Netherlands, Turkey, or Romania. The corn we produce is used in fuel and animal feed. Um, so, um, and we can enjoy a taco bowl in Washington, in Alaska, in Maine, in California, and we can do it 365 days a year. So I partly talk about uh, food in that sense, and there's a section in the book of, I don't want to ruin it for those who have not read the book yet, Norm, um, <laughs> that uh, back in 75, a long time ago, the average supermarket had maybe 9,000 items. And uh, there's a picture in here when Boris Yeltsin visited America and um, on his way, before he left the country, he went to Houston uh, to Randall's supermarket and is just amazed at, first of all, his first reaction is, where are the lines? Because he can't. <laughs> and he, he commented, he said, well, I'm in Houston. This is a quote unquote, as he called it, a provincial market as opposed to in New York. And it already had 30,000 choices of ham, sausages, cheeses, fruits, vegetables. And today, it's close to 50,000 in an average supermarket. Um, and a lot of that, again, has to do with trade. So I also talk about the banana uh, as an um, uh, indication of trade. All of our bananas come from essentially five Central American countries. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, uh, oh, I actually left my iPhone in, in there, so it would not ring. Anybody in this room have an iPhone? Just, OK. So. Um, Greg Ipp is here from the Wall Street Journal. So the Wall Street Journal had an excerpt of the book. Um, the iPhone is a example of trying to understand trade. Uh, the iPhone was, yes, designed here. The rare earth minerals that are in there come from Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, it's probably a little early in the day to have hit your 10,000 steps. Anybody keep track of those steps? Uh, that's because there's a chip from the Netherlands that actually helps manage your steps. And when you turn the phone, either landscape or portrait, uh, and it, it perfectly adjusts, uh, that gyroscope comes from Switzerland. And the display comes from Samsung, Apple's big competitor from Korea. And the glass, which regrettably frequently does crack, um, comes from Corning, New York. All of this is assembled in China. Uh, it's hard to get the exact number from um, uh, Apple, but about the estimates are $8.46. I've heard $5, but essentially, certainly less than $10 of the actual cost of the iPhone is, comes from China. And yet, the entire iPhone is considered a Chinese import by the World Trade Organization, by our own government. So, we import about $16 billion worth of iPhones. It contributes $16 billion to the trade deficit that President Trump uh, is so obsessed with, and yet a very, very small portion 
of that iPhone actually comes from China. So I use that in the book to first illustrate, one, so we better understand what a supply chain is, and two, the folly, and I would say the, the um, hard to understand obsession of this administration with bilateral trade deficits, including on this trip to India this week, where there's a $30 billion trade deficit that we're crowing about will go to $20 billion, and I mean, that's a, not even a rounding number in our economy. Um, so uh, one of the things I try and do in the book is debunk a, a number of myths, that being one of them, in terms of bilateral trade deficits. Uh, I also look at uh, automobiles. Um, anybody have an idea what the most American car, on the, if you read the book, you can't answer the question. The most American car on the road? Close. It's the Honda Odyssey. 75% of the Honda Odyssey is designed and made and manufactured in this country. Um, and in fact, when the book came out a few weeks ago, and there was a book event here in Washington, uh, instead of sending 75 books, they sent 15 books. So the publisher panicked on how we're going to get 60 books to Washington on four or five hours notice. And to the rescue was Uber. And coincidentally, they sent a Honda Odyssey to bring the books to Washington. <laughs> So it felt very apt to that, how it came. So the Honda Odyssey is the most American car on the road. Uh, the top 10 or 11 are either Honda or Acuras. Um, then there's a Mercedes and the most, uh, quote unquote, American mark. Uh, the Chevy Corvette clocks in at 13. Uh, and all that is to say, we need to understand what is American product, what's an imported product. And the fact is, we rely on global supply chains in order to produce better cars. Um, I don't know about you, I'm of an age, I remember we had a Buick Skylark. It was, the color was champagne mist, I remember that. I, my friend said it certainly mist. You know, the color didn't match so well, it leaked in the rain, um, the windows squeaked. <laughs> Our cars are better, they last longer, they're better quality, they run over 100,000 miles, and I would say that global competition and global supply chains is one reason we have a robust automobile manufacturing facility and capability in this country today that left to our own devices, we might not. You know, before the Japanese started bringing cars into this country and manufacturing them here and assembling them here, it was 90%, it was essentially, it was almost a cartel of uh, Ford, GM, and Chrysler. Um, the last two products I talk about are, uh, one is higher education, um, completely overlooked as an export. Um, and as chairman of the Export Input Bank, we did overlook higher education as an export. We were not very good at service exports, but we have over one, about 1.1 million foreign students studying in this country. Um, they generate about uh, $42 billion worth of, of export revenue because we're exporting a service of an education about 450,000 jobs. And one of the things that we don't hear in the trade debate is how we should be really bolstering service exports. And that's what I'd like to just sort of close with on that. And that is, we, so we, we and we also have one of the few countries in the world with actually a surplus of seats in colleges around this country. Um, uh, and in fact, when I was uh, in Greg's office, I was talking to Jerry Seib, uh, and as I was writing the book, and that's what inspired me to actually add that chapter because he's a trustee, I think, at the University of Kansas and was talking about how universities have been able to compensate for the lack of sort of state support that have happened to a lot of state units, but have not been able to make up the revenue loss from foreign students. And as uh, John Sexton uh, quoted in this book, said that um, uh, foreign students are the narcotic higher education. It's the addiction that higher ed requires and needs. And on top of that, the important thing is that the improvement in the classroom life by having foreign students and students from around the world benefits American students. And I also would say it has, we have trained many foreign leaders around the world have studied in the United States. And in fact, at one point, the, um, the prime minister of Greece and his largest opponent were actually roommates together at Amherst College. Um, 
I also tried to get that photograph in the book, but we could not find the yearbook photographer who did that photograph. <laughs> um, and lastly, I talk about Game of Thrones. Um, I know nobody in here watched Game of Thrones. But, no. uh, but Game of Thrones um, is an example of where the future is going in terms of entertainment, in terms of, um, well, entertainment, uh, I would say all services, consulting, legal, insurance. But if we think about entertainment, that, that program we have is now in 100, was in 170 countries, uh, generated uh, millions and millions of dollars of revenue to the United States. But the actors, the designers, the um, uh, film crew come from all over the world. And you could not make that program without open borders and people being able to travel freely in order to produce those kinds of services. Um, so what we need to be focusing on much more is where we excel, and that is in services, as I said, higher education, entertainment, financial services, legal, consulting. These are the things that are the future. These are the things that are a competitive advantage, and yet so much of the dialogue today is simply around um, cars, airplanes, power plants, you know, manufactured goods, and agriculture. We're one of the few advanced economies that actually runs a surplus in commodities as well. Um, so to leave you, and before we have the discussion, I think what I wanted to highlight is one, trade as any policy thing, we, any policy decision we make in this country, will have winners and losers. And we have done a bad job, and I, I think our elected officials have done a bad job of acknowledging they're gonna be winners and losers. Because if we acknowledge truly they're gonna be losers, then we need to do something about them. And to simply pretend that it's a win-win, that everybody benefits, well, on average, everybody benefits, but communities were hollowed out, people lost their jobs, people were not able to sort of reboot their economy, and, and people were not able to su provide support for their families, and that was devastating. And we devastated a lot of communities by trade, and now, frankly, automation and artificial intelligence. And we need to really begin to much more seriously think about how we're going to remedy that, because if we don't remedy that, we're going to have a much bigger problem than we had with trade. So trade clearly has winners and losers. Trade deals, by the way, are not about jobs, uh, which is another thing I try and point out. Um, so those are some of the takeaways. China, I talk about China in this book. China has clearly been a bad actor. President Trump is right on that score. They have been a bad actor. They have not sort of played by the rules. The WTO was not ideally um, set up to deal with a competitor of that size and scale. And we need to address that issue. And we're, we're reluctant to do that as well. And right now it appears we are embarking on an approach on trade that's much more unilateral. Uh, it's not as multilateral, I would say, since it's been since World War II. Um, and it may be satisfying to the administration, but it is whether it really will have um, generate the kind of results that President Trump thinks it will generate remains to be seen. So with that, let me turn it back over to Stan, and he'll tell me where to sit. <laughs> and we'll raffle off the avocado. <laughs> The, um, right, that was great. All right. Um, so the uh, the former Greek foreign minister who uh, went to Emirates, he is now the EU ambassador to the United States. Oh, he uh, is. Really, oh, I have. Oh, then I should definitely give him a call. Exports have really, have really paid off. Yeah, he's right here on, on L Street. Um, he's very good, probably in part because you know he's been engaged in the uh, services trade flows for for so long. Um, uh, well, thank you very much. I wanted to, uh, maybe we're going to try and make this conversational, so feel free to you know, raise a hand or talk over the other person. Uh, debate kind of style. Yeah, we're doing, <laughs> this is like, <laughs> practicing for, for, for the next primary debate. Um, but I wanted to first go to, to, to Carlin. So you, you mentioned that poll numbers look reasonably good on trade policy, and I asked Carlin to, uh, to talk about that a little bit and how, uh, how Americans see uh, uh, international trade and how those views have evolved. Would you? 
Thanks, Dan. Um, and also, congratulations on the book. I think this is a terrific way to sell, to sell trade policy overall. In thinking about trade, I'd like to take you back to a question that was asked for the first time by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, one of the best polling outfits on foreign policy, in 1974. And the question's been asked 15 times since then. It's a question about the most important foreign policy goals for the United States. All sorts of issues are included in the long list from the Chicago Council. And what's interested in me in all of those questions in number one or two position has been protecting the jobs of American workers. And again, when you think about it, it's competing with issues like stopping the spread of nuclear weapons. And so to me, that just shows this is the context in which you have to think about trade. We're very fortunate this morning because Gallup released just three hours ago a new poll on its question that they've asked since the early 1990s on foreign trade showing the highest support for a free trading environment and the history of that Gallup poll, again, going back to the early 1990s. Um, and not only that, but in the, in the poll this morning, uh, you saw a solid majority support for the USMCA. And again, some very, very positive attitudes overall. And I think we need to think about how to interpret that data. It also has a rare bipartisan consensus with 79% supporting in the um, seeing uh, foreign trade as an opportunity for economic growth and only 18% as a threat um, in terms of imports. Um, as I said, rare bipartisan convention with Democrats and Republicans, solid majorities seeing trade in the same way. Um, Republicans and Democrats switched positions, but long before Trump was elected. They switched positions in 2011 and 2012, and now Republicans are a little bit more skeptical about trade than are Democrats overall. Um, what was interesting about that question, and Gallup didn't refer to it in its release this morning, but in March 2019, for the first time, um, they found that Americans were saying that free trade benefits American workers. That usually lags behind all of the other indicators overall. Um, my own view, and again looking at the historical data on this high support for free trade right now, is that the good economy that Americans are experiencing now, the fact that they think they and their families are getting along pretty well, has boosted support for free, for free, trade, free trade generally. Um, as I said, the public is supportive now of USMCA and also the phase one China deal, but I'm not sure that, those, that Donald Trump deserves any credit for the numbers we're seeing in polls about those two things overall. Um, rather, what I think the public is saying is that government finally got something done. Um, Gallup's asked a question since 1935. It's an open-ended question. You can give them whatever answer you want. What's the biggest problem facing the country today? And for the last five years running, it's been government government not getting anything done. And so I think the support that we're seeing for those two things reflects the fact that government actually did something and they did something in a bipartisan way. Um, we haven't mentioned the coronavirus yet. I noticed also in the Gallup poll this morning that 69% were worried about the impact it could have on foreign trade. And I confess I don't know how to interpret that data at this point. Americans seem pretty confident of the elite agencies that take the lead in this particular area, but it could have an impact on some of these numbers that I've just discussed. And so I'll stop there, but congratulations again. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, Damon Carlin just said that Americans now believe that American workers, I guess, I suppose, qua Western, workers especially, yeah. benefit from from international trade, and uh, I think I will treat you as the voice of the American worker, the, okay. <laughs> the labor movement. Um, obviously, the, your, the AFL-CIO, the labor movement in general, has had a more complicated relationship with international uh, trade, but you, uh, you guys supported the USMCA. Can you talk a bit about w you know, what, to what extent you think international trade has benefited the US, American workers, where there have been issues that you have not approved of? <laughs> yeah, a couple. Um, so first, um, Stan, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, and, and, no, thank you for coming. Yeah. And uh, let me just say a word or two both about uh, this, uh, our, our host here at AI and, uh, and Fred, um, and then I'll try to answer your question. Um, it, it, this is really a, a joy for me at two levels. One is um, I always like coming to the American Enterprise Institute because I find the discourse here to be, in a certain way, open-minded. Highly principled, but but not completely predictable and across a wide range of issues. And, and uh, the, war the welcome always warm for the labor movement. And that's just, not, that's just not how Washington works more generally. 
So I'm just pleased to be here and always try to, try to say yes. Secondly, well, a lot of people here park over at the SEIUs. So <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> now you're getting into internal <laughs> labor movement <laughs> stuff. Uh, the, uh, and, and a particular pleasure for me to be here with Fred, uh, who uh, is uh, a trade policy maker that has always that we've always uh, had a very productive uh, relationship with, whose tireless labors on behalf of American exports uh, are much appreciated by the AFL-CIO and by our members who don't know his name or that he exists. <laughs> but uh, but the impact uh, the impact of his work uh, on our members' lives has been really beneficial. Yeah, I'm going to tell you quick. Can you mention that I was out in. Um, at the Ford plant in Chicago with President Obama in 2010. And we had just uh, approved a loan for Ford, which is the one company that avoided bankruptcy. Right. Um, and what we, I didn't figure it out, some very smart people at the Export Input Bank figured it out, we collateralized vehicles that left the Ford factory in transit to the port of Houston when they were shipped overseas. And so every 12 days that it was a revolving line of credit, and they got $300 million, and it's one of the ways they were able to stay out of uh, bankruptcy. Right. So President Obama, it just coincidentally, nobody would please, you know, it took six months to get this deal done. The deal gets announced a week later, President Obama goes to speak, and it was, a line was inserted in the speech. And the workers understood if they were exporting cars, that meant they, those jobs were gonna stick around. Right. And they got this huge round of applause, and everybody on the White House staff would come, that was not the applause line. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because just what you said, they understood if they're exporting those vehicles, that means these jobs are here to stay. I, I, well, <laughs> in, that, that has generally been true, but not <laughs> always. Yes, <laughs> but it was just that, that yeah. was the one time the, the workers understood what the export bank was more than most people in the White House. <laughs> okay, I, I, the, the point is the Export-Import Bank is a really valued institution by the labor movement, by our affiliates, and by our members. Um, and, and, and Fred's stewardship there was, uh, was, in our view, outstanding. Thank you. Um, so now I want to come to, the, to Stan's question. <laughs> uh, you know, Fred's book is a, you know, an eloquent uh, defense of, the, of just the, the, the sort of broad notion that trade is a positive force, that international trade is a positive force in modern life. I don't think that we in the American labor movement actually have an argument with that proposition at that level, right? But it, life is not actually lived at that level. And, the, um, and I think you know, if, if you're fortunate enough to, to read through Fred's book and get to the accounts of things like, like the history of the banana industry uh, in South America, you will see that the, or that, that, these sto that the actual lived experience of trade uh, and the specific issues associated with it um, are, are, where, uh, <laughs> are where the problem comes up. Uh, because um, l I think the best way to understand why this is true is, is through two points. One is, is that to the extent that, you, that, one, that countries enter into truly free trade, so to speak, fully integrated trading relationships, they've essentially integrated their economies and to a significant degree their societies. This is sort of the hidden, <laughs> sort of the hidden meaning of, of Fred's stories about, for example, the rising popularity of guacamole, right, is that, is that through our trading relationships, the United States has become a much more global society in a lot of different ways. That's actually a good thing. The problem comes in terms of what are the rules. If you're economically integrating with a society that has a wage level that's a tenth of yours, right, th that raises really serious issues, particularly if one society is using public policy to suppress wages, another society is not. Or to take a more extreme example, which I think, which is our view, has been largely the case, for example, in Mexico during the time of NAFTA, it, if there are serious labor rights and human rights problems associated with those wage differentials, then, and rule of law problems, then you really, then the question is what type of relationships is, is this? A and, um, and that comes to the second point, which is very powerfully addressed in Fred's book in the banana chapter, which is that free trade is often a cover for some extremely coercive situations. Um, and uh, I, th I think a particularly funny example of this is, Fred, you talk a couple of times about 
the, the British view of trade uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, before, before the Second World War and Winston Churchill and so forth. You know, <laughs> it's, the British like to talk about their history as if they didn't have an empire, uh, but they did. Right? And, and British trade policy was not free in any sense uh, if you were, for example, uh, a resident of the Indian subcontinent. Right? You did not experience that as free in any, in any right. respect. Um, and in fact, I would say that a lot of the real roots of Brexit have to do with the long reckoning with this, uh, with this experience and the difficulties they're having with it. But my point is, you have this issue of economic integration and what are economic, social, and ultimately political integration, and what are the rules? And then B, you have this question of underneath this, what kind of coercion is going on? Uh, and f so for example, I don't think it's possible to tell the story of the assembly of the iPhone without talking about the kind of coercion that is involved in the Foxconn production process. Right? Now, I think, and I'll, and I'll wind up here because this can be going forever, but the USMCA, is a really sort of almost unique uh, example of a serious effort on the part of an unlikely group of people. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, Bob Lighthizer, the leadership of the labor movement, particularly my boss, President, President Trumpka of the AFL-CIO, to seriously try to address, through a trade negotiation, the imbalance that exists between the US and Mexican labor markets and the labor rights problems in Mexico. Now, I, actually, I was just talking about the U.S. side. It's very important to recognize we had real partners in Mexico on this. The Mexican president, the Mexican trade uh, rep, uh, the Mexican legislators who were involved in that process equally wanted to, to address this problem. And uh, I'll tell you, the, 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 the first draft of the USMCA was one that we could not have supported. A very tough negotiating process ensued, and we made real progress, and we got to something that we thought was clearly, while not perfect, an improvement. Um, that would never have happened if, the, if there wasn't this kind of sense among all of these parties that the, that, the, that the issue of labor rights and wage suppression in Mexico had to be addressed and addressed seriously. And so I think that should suggest a possible path forward. Um, but I think if you think for a moment about the circumstances in China, you can see how challenging that path forward will be in our other major trading relationships. I'll stop there, but obviously this is a this is a subject we could go into in great for sure great uh, detail. Uh, Fred, do you want to talk about bananas for a little bit? Well, I was also going to. I, I mean, almost got you one in addition to. The <laughs> well, I, the, uh, I went I went to Mexico to re, on the research of the book, and I would say that there was um, too little, too late, but widespread understanding that their suppression of wage rates for twenty years was their sort of simplistic and knee-jerk response, how we're going to be, may, remain competitive. And I would say there was acknowledgment in the, in the government and in the private sector and in the sort of NGO sector that they had really bungled this thing in a major way. And I think I was asked, why did Mexico agree to the USMCA? I think, I think that they felt in a very vulnerable position. They kind of knew they had not sort of lived up to what the expectation was, and they were just desperate to make sure that they, it did not go away. Um, I talk about the banana and, um, and uh, the very brutal um, experience of uh, ultimately the Chiquita Banana Company and, and, uh, and the five countries that essentially supply our bananas. And bananas are the most consumed fruit in this 27 pounds per capita, I, that's a lot of bananas. Uh, <laughs> and, but I even make a comment in there, in, in, the, in the development of the banana trade, the, how we brutalized, I mean, the United Fruit Company had a land area essentially the size of the state of Connecticut, which is a large tract of land that they essentially controlled. And the whole idea of a banana republic comes out of, from all of that. And by the way, it's the, it's the playbook that the Chinese are trying, have been trying to deploy in Sub-Saharan Africa for the last 10, 20 years. It, it was wrong when we did it, quote unquote, in the 19th century, and it's wrong when they were doing it in the 20th and 21st century, where they would, they're gonna build a railroad in order to get access to minerals or liquefied natural gas, and they brutalize the population, they take advantage of it, they, take, they 
extract very high um, uh, royalty rates on all that stuff. So it is, mm -hmm. it is an area, as with Foxconn, that, and I do talk about it at the end of the book, I think at the end of the day, it has to be consumers who call companies to challenge, whether it's fair traded coffee, uh, there's a movement to do that in tomatoes, and whether we have better information as consumers, because we're probably the best able to discipline those kind of behaviors, along with government, and simply say, there's a certain, I don't want to buy products that are, whether it's clothing that's in a sweatshop or where they're deploying child labor. So I think we are making improvements in those areas, and we need to keep doing that. So the, let, me, let me say two things before uh, going to Greg. So, uh, First of all, if, you, if you're ever interested in reading a very mediocre, relatively short novel, there's a <laughs> book by a guy, that, his pen name is O. Henry, titled Cabbages and Kings. That's yes. where the term Banana Republic comes from. Yes, it's in there, right. Uh, they, uh, yeah, so he was living in, in Honduras at the time? Right? Yes. The, uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, if that's what you're in the market for, uh, I, I recommend it. Uh, 1904, I think, something like that. Um, I think we all read that in high school. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, the um, second thing I would say, so the one concern I think people have about trade agreements like the USMCA is that the U.S. uses its, its bargaining power to interfere in the domestic public policies of other countries. Um, obviously, you know, and there, it, the issue is if, as long as you like the way in which it interferes in other countries' politics, you know, that's, that's fine. But I don't know that that's necessarily a, a plus overall, right? We've now seen in the, uh, I guess, partial trade agreement with China that that the U.S. has really forced China to, to, to centralize a ton of purchases, right? The list of exports that China has committed to includes things like tourism, right? So, you know, the, so the U.S. is forcing China to force Chinese tourists uh, to travel to the U.S. I don't know that that... <laughs> well, until recently. Well, until, yeah, well, <laughs> not... Yeah, 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 sure. But that was the original plan, obviously. <laughs> As these types of central plans go, a week later they may not be uh, what you what you want. But so I, I, I would be uh, a, little more, a little more hesitant um, uh, there. But so I wanted to talk to... Uh, well, also the challenge is if we put in, if we require certain rules for Vietnam clothing manufacturers, we, the risk is then those manufacturers pick up and they move to Bangladesh. And if they're not happy in Bangladesh, then they move to Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's one reason I put a little more stock into consumers. And... Um, we have to be careful. We're sitting in a very nice room in a very in a first world country, and uh, as was demonstrated to me by uh, a professor at, uh, at Chicago, I actually ordered his class when I was there. He said, you know, he made the entire class get up, and he said, I want you to bend over, and it's 100 degrees, and you're going to be in that position in a rice paddy for 10 hours. And the sweatshop is not a great place to work, but we have to get out of our own way and say, right now there are not a lot of alternatives in some of these places. So before we condemn that wholeheartedly, we have to look at alternatives. I don't know what the right answer is. I don't, you know, sweatshops are not the right answer, but um, having factories then, corporations pick up and move to a place where they have no labor regulations, that's not an answer either. So, I mean, I think these are, they require government intervention, they require us to exacts certain standards, and it requires, I think, consumers to also be aware of it and not just pick the cheapest product. I, I, I would, if you don't mind, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I've been around these debates a long time, and I often find that, that people are most enthusiastic about sweatshops who are furthest away from them. Um, and, uh, you know, um, but I think the point Analytically, the point that's being made here goes back to what I was saying about the fact that, that, that free trade agreements are really economic integration agreements, and there, ha and there have to be rules associated right. with those. Yeah. Now, a person could say, well, I'm against labor regulation, right? I think, you know, you could take a libertarian position and say, well, we shouldn't have, uh, you know, we shouldn't have minimum wages or, child la or laws against child labor and this kind of thing. But if you think that we ought to, if you buy into kind of the the sort of post-New Deal consensus around some of these issues in the United States. Understand, when you, if you enter into a free trade agreement with a country that doesn't have those rules, you've just gutted them here. And, right. the, and so it's not a simple, it is not a simple question 
what the right approach is to economic integration between countries that have a tenfold difference in wages. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea that you can just walk in and say, well, the minimum wage in, you know, in Chiapas is now the same as it is in Detroit, it, it, that's not, I don't think anybody's quite saying that. Exactly. But on the other hand, and I think, Fred, this is one of the, perhaps one of the shortcomings in the timing of your book, is that now I think there's quite pretty convincing evidence that the main impact of NAFTA uh, was not job loss, as you, as you show in your book. It was wage suppression. Right? This is what uh, uh, Otters, David Otter's work, I right. think, who was a basically pro-trade economist, is that that's what that's you know, pretty much definitively shown. The, the, the lesson of this experience is the, what the rules are matter. They, and they matter, they matter hugely. And there has to, and we know that, by the way, when we look at things like, uh, when, we, when we look at things like uh, how you know intellectual property is treated, uh, how uh, uh, you know whether or not there gets to their their uh, you know discriminatory regulatory treatment, that sort of thing. I mean, at one level, everybody understands that when you enter into a free trade agreement, you enter into a common legal and, and economic right. system. Uh, but that, that lesson tends to be forgotten when it comes to, to, to working people. And the consequences of that amnesia um, have been very severe. Right? We would not be having this conversation in this way in this room right? if it had not been that the political foundations of, tr of trade policy in this country have collapsed. Right? And, and regardless of what the polls show, show, in reality, in terms of who's got power where, the... the, the, the the, tr the somewhat naive trade policies of the 90s are, have been wiped out politically. I, I, I think, I, well, I would, uh, I, would say, I would say David Otter is probably about as anti-trade as it gets conditional on someone being an economist, but otherwise, uh, I think so. so <laughs> you, you don't know the economists <laughs> I know. <laughs> the, um, Greg, I wanted to ask you, and I, I do think there's definitely do, been Do you know Peter Navarro? The, uh, <laughs> trade economist, not whatever he does. The, the, um, so there's been a pretty dramatic shift, as, as David said, certainly at the policymaking level in, in, in how people look at trade policy and the policy that's been made. Can you talk a bit about how you've seen that change over the last few years, how suddenly trade policy has become really important in driving financial markets, you know, the more general economic implications? So I think Fred makes three really important points in the book. Uh, the first is that cheap imports, trade's not just about exports, it's about being able to import things more cheaply or that we couldn't have before, number one. Number two is that bilateral deficits don't matter, an obvious point to most economists, but not obvious to the average person. And number three, that it's not just things you can drop on your foot that matter, it's also services. And you make a good point about that. The United States is a very successful uh, producer and exporter of high value services like it, such as uh, secondary education. And these are three very important points about trade. They're always important, but they're especially important now because we currently have a president who doesn't actually believe any of those things. And he has tried to drive policy in a direction to reflect his own mistaken beliefs in those things. Now, the interesting thing about Trump is that he's a little bit like Bernie Sanders, which is that he believes certain things, and he has believed those same things for about 40 years. He has always believed. And the thing about Trump is that he's not really a protectionist. He's a mercantilist. What does that mean? It means he's fine with imports as long as we get to export more, is that the point of importing is to allow us only to export. And that if, for some reason, we are exporting less than we import, then we are some level being ripped off. He said that about the Japanese 30 years ago. He says that about the Chinese, about virtually everybody today. During the 2016 campaign, he would still occasionally, accidentally say Japan instead of China. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, it's been saying the same for 30 years. It's hard to actually like, change yeah. the message when you've been saying the same thing. So he comes into office, and he tries to basically implement a trade policy that reflects those longstanding beliefs. But he does so against a world that has changed and is not really you know, reflective of those things. So I would describe the first term, uh, the Trump term one policy sort of like looks as follows. Two sets of, uh, two policies for two different parts of the world, a policy for China and a policy for everybody else. Now with respect to China, he actually is onto something because I think as we all agree is that the, <laughs> it's not just Trump who doesn't believe those three things about your book, Fred, Chinese China doesn't either. <laughs> China does not believe that the point of trade is to get cheap imports. It doesn't. China believes that the point of trade is to be able to sell more Chinese-made stuff to other countries and eventually acquire from other countries the expertise necessary to replace every single imported good. That is basically the path China has now been on for 25 years. China doesn't really care about services. They're quite happy to have Chinese tourists go abroad 
you know, we're now seeing the consequences of that in terms of they spread things like coronavirus. But they've also found that tourism is a very useful weapon for essentially like exerting mm -hmm. their influence over whether it's New Zealand or Hong Kong. Hey, New Zealand, hey, South Korea, you do something we don't like, you can say goodbye to the Chinese tourists, okay? So you, um, Trump taking on China on its own terms, as I actually think, is a net positive. And in fact, he's not alone in this. You know, I think people in this room, if it's Derek Scissors here by any chance this morning, but Derek, if you were, he would be fully in agreement that China has been not playing by the rules that we assumed they would when they joined the World Trade Organization. And, and a confrontation was at some point necessary. And I'm not even sure if the, the, it is definitely the case that the trade war with China has cost the United States. But I'm not sure that we know yet whether that's a bad thing. Because if you're going to break some glass because China's misbehaving, some, there has to be costs paid. So that's the China side. The other side is the rest of the world side. Now, the problem here is that the, Trump wanted to take basically his foundational beliefs that are true with respect to China cheating and apply it to every other country, including Canada, Mexico, Japan, and the European Union. And that's just not true. Those countries, by and large, operate more or less like we do. They are market economies, right? And our bilateral deficits with them are not especially notable. And so when he tried to apply that policy, whether it was by, for example, the steel tariffs and the aluminum tariffs, mm -hmm. or threatening uh, car tariffs and so forth, threatening to tear up NAFTA and so on, what happened? First of all, he ran into a buzzsaw of opposition from three very important constituencies. Congress, both sides of the aisle, did not want to tear up NAFTA. Governors of border states who did not want the jobs loss that would come from being able to not being able to sell stuff to Mexico or not being able to buy avocados for Super Bowl Sunday. And number three, our allies who are not going to sit there and take it. And so much to the surprise of the Trump administration, they didn't just sit there and take it. Canada retaliated. Mexico retaliated. The European Union retaliated. And that exacerbated the backlash among exporters, whether it's in Kentucky or Minnesota, who were being affected by those tariffs. So at the end of the Trump term, we're at what I kind of call like Ronald Reagan squared. And in the sense that Reagan... We think of him as a free trader, but he was, until Trump, the most protectionist president we had. And he was protectionist because he was responding to powerful vocal constituencies in the United States. Fred, the reason those Honda Odysseys are made in the United States is because Japan, responding to Reagan's protectionism, right. put assembly right. plants in the United States. That wasn't Ricardian comparative advantage at work. I'm sorry, <laughs> all right? No. That was real politic, OK? So in some sense, Trump's policies with respect to the non-China part of the world are probably not that different if you had had a kind of like a Reagan-esque type person. But that's term one. I think term two is a very different picture. Assuming Trump is reelected, as the prediction markets say that he will be, I think that term two Trump will look much more like um, the foundational Trump than we've seen in the sense that I think that the guardrails presented by those counterforces of Congress, governors, and our allies will be much weaker. He doesn't need to get reelected, so he will be much more indifferent to the economic costs of a trade war. And I think that the damage uh, or the potential disruption to global trade and the economy <coughs> in the second term of Trump unbound are concomitantly greater than they have been in the first term. And by the way, I do want to make one point about yeah. the, Carlin, your interpretation of the polls, because I have a slightly different interpretation about why support for free trade is so high right now. We live in an era that is deeply polarized. Mm -hmm. And trade has now become sort of like part of people's cultural identity in the sense that it used to be, Damon, you grew up in a world where most political issues were left versus right. Do we want higher or lower yeah. taxes, bigger government, lower government, more powerful unions or weaker unions? We're now living in a world where it's more sort of globalist versus nationalist, cosmopolitan versus communal. And that is a very powerful part of people's identification. Right. And one of the reasons support for free trade is going up is because there's a lot of people who identify that with their cosmopolitan, globalist, non-Trump identity. And I'm not sure they've actually given a lot of thought no. to what it means. Taco trucks at every corner is the... Uh... Yeah, you know, well, that, well, yeah, exactly, you know exactly. half the country says, oh, my God, taco trucks on the, every corner. And the other half says, ooh, ooh taco trucks on every, every corner. corner. Exactly. <laughs> and you also have a generational effect here, too. You have the new global generation that's really changing attitude yeah. in a lot of ways in exactly the way you've suggested. Yeah. The, um, so Carl mentioned it briefly earlier, Greg, but I know that you're, you, you, you wrote an article about the coronavirus and its impact. And can you, you want to talk about that a little bit, too, and give us actionable. <laughs> oh, so coronavirus is essentially one of those sort of, uh, you know, um, black swan events, right? Uh, we've been through this before. We had 9-11, you know, we had SARS, we had mm -hmm. Ebola and all sorts. So in some sense, we've had those things before. I think that why the coronavirus is especially impactful now is that, number one, it's larger uh, than, for example, SARS. But second of all, those previous events came against an environment when the consensus in the United States on both sides of the aisle was that globalization is good, all else equal, we should seek to lower barriers, borders. Right 
barriers instead of raising them. We're now in a world which is just the opposite. And my concern is that the legitimate public health reasons to limit international travel and trade are being compounded on a predisposition to want to raise barriers because it suits your nationalistic agenda. You know, Wilbur Ross was on TV, I think this was about a month ago, when he said, it's terrible what this coronavirus thing is doing. But on the other hand, yeah. you know, American companies, here's another reason to bring your supply chains back to the United States. And I think that that, you know, like in Europe, they're already, there's already pressure to sort of like question open, you know, free movement of people for reasons of, you know, uh, um, social dumping, as they, mm -hmm. as they call it, or terrorism. And I think it, it be, the, the coronavirus tends to compound those uh, things. Certainly Schengen, maybe not free movement. Um, Garland, do you want to speculate on how the coronavirus situation is going to affect you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really... Give it a shot. Fred, we... Uh, the only thing I would say about the coronavirus is... is Wash your hands. You wash your hands. <laughs> you know, as a little kid, you hate your parents say, wash your hands all the time. Now I, I feel like I wash it as often as possible <laughs> in this environment. But I think that the coronavirus hopefully does say that we're a much more integrated world than we would like to believe, or President Trump sometimes talks about it as though we could build a moat around this country. And that is, whether it's health, whether it's the environment, whether it's trade and supply chains, we're too integrated to try and reverse that. You know, we'll have to deal with this terrible epidemic that right now, but there's no way that we can go back to a, an era. I mean, the United States is unique in that we have two giant oceans, and we've always been somewhat insulated and isolated in that way. But it isn't, hopefully people realize there's just, there's no going back on this. Well, it's also important to keep in mind, right? So the, someone like, like David Otter or Danny Roderick, who's you know, maybe a little more skeptical of trade than than, than I would be there. I think their most effective argument is some of these most recent trade agreements, they read they only cut tariffs by a little bit, and so they get you relatively small welfare gains for large disruptions in terms of sort of absolute changes in where industries are located and things like that. Of course, the moment we revert to slightly higher tariffs, right, you get small welfare losses, but again, massive disruption, right? And so I think that's important to keep in mind, too, that the that, that those large disruptions are, are symmetric. And if we try to decouple like some of the more aggressive, uh, uh, I think China hawks would like to see, that would lead to the same kinds of disruptions that we, that we saw uh, over the past uh, 20, 30 years. Um, and so but one thing I wanted to ask you, as you mentioned it briefly, what, have you seen examples of you know, good policies to help people who uh, you know, see themselves dislocated Later on in their in their work lives, uh, because you know whether even if trade policy remained exactly where it is right now, right, you always have a lot of churn because of automation and, and you know creative destruction. And right. what is there anything you've seen that really inspires well, a lot of people? Well, um, there was a uh, Robert Holloman was the number two person at U.S. Trade Representative, um, and he uses this term lifelong readiness. Um, and if you think about it, if we're going to have a hurricane or a Bad snowstorm, you may stock up on certain provisions in your house. You need to be ready. Uh, spare batteries and all that kind of stuff. And I, I think it's a better concept than lifelong learning. Uh, you know, if, if, if you said to me, Fred, we're going to send you to Vietnam or Korea to work for a year and you need to go and be able to speak the language fluently, I would say, um, is there another choice? <laughs> the idea of having to, you know, at this age, learn a whole new language and to operate would be kind of daunting and not something I might look forward to. So partly I think we gotta get out of this idea that you know, 70% of Americans do not finish college. They either have a high school degree or they start college and don't finish. And so they often feel at the age of 18 they're done. And, or if people go to college they may feel they're done at the age of 22. I mean, we have to sort of erase that whole idea that you're quote unquote done with your education. I mean, I'm not worried about the people in this room. You're here because you know you're not done with your education. Otherwise, you wouldn't be, have registered today to learn something, uh, or hopefully learn something. Um, so there, you know, there are experiments. Gina Raimondo has done a number of things in the state of Rhode Island to really raise the sort of education level and teaching essential computer skills in elementary schools. She's got some uh, partnerships with the electric boat company, which is a fancy word for submarines, where they train people so that they can get an education to go work in those places and keep improving skills. Uh, I met a man 
in this book named, a great name, Rusty Justice in uh, Pikeville, Kentucky, who has trained a lot of coal, former coal miners to be coders. That's his birth name? That's his birth name. Is that a good name? It's a very good name. Um, like Justice Learned Hand, you know, Rusty <laughs> Justice. <laughs> Um, so I think we, you know, one of the things about having a federal system, we can try a lot of different things. And uh, partly, I think, David, you know, on one side of the aisle, they sort of, there's often a sense the private sector can do all of this stuff. And on the other hand, uh, uh, doing everything at the government level and everything at the federal level may not be the way. We're going to have to find rural solutions, urban solutions. Some will work in some states. Some will work in more agricultural states. Um, and we're going to, but having people who are ready to face the future, Bill Clinton, in I think in his second term, talked about people having eight jobs in their lifetime, and he got a lot of pushback because that was really threatening to people. Well, that's what eight would probably be a minimum today, uh, and we have to start mm -hmm. talking about it. when 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 at commencement time. Come May, June, we should be talking about this is going to commence the rest of your education, not just commence your life. And I think we need to just sure. start talking that way. So, so I think one important thing in this discussion about adjustment is that we kind of need to take the word trade out of it. We need to stop say, are talking as if there's something special about trade-related mm -hmm. dislocation. As David Otter himself will point out the China shock is basically over. It was over around 2008, 2009. Right. The data do not show that disruption continued past that point. In fact, most of the imbalances we complained about have shrunk since then. The disruption that's coming at us from now, I would argue, is primarily from things like automation and uh, so forth. Those things are in the background all along. Perhaps even more so, the transition to a low carbon environment. I mean, the people in Lordstown aren't losing their jobs because of competition from China. It's because General Motors wants to build electric cars, and that requires a completely different you know, yeah. supply chain instead of technologies. So I think one thing we need as a country is to be have a somewhat sort of like um, disruption neutral types of policies, sort of like get away from the idea that like trade adjustment assistance. It's, I think everybody who's looked at it agrees that it's almost impossible to identify in a meaningful way, the people who actually literally did lose their jobs to trade. I mean, this disruption is going to come at us from all directions. And I think the smart people, like Gina Raimondo and others that you've talked about, are sort of a looking at like uh, adjustment assistance as kind of a, a full life thing and somewhat agnostic as to why your life got adjusted yeah. or your life got disrupted. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a bunch of things about this type of conversation, which is very common in Washington, that's just dead wrong. It's just factually wrong. You want to list them? So let's start with this. Uh, working class people change jobs less frequently today than they did in the 1970s. Right? Labor mobility in this country is down. Right. It, it's only really up among people, among elites, right? for, whom now, for whom work is now no longer associated with a corporate or university kind of sinecure. Spatial mobility is down pretty yes. dramatically too. Spatial mobility is down, yeah. job mobility is down. Secondly, in terms of technological change, perhaps that is going to happen, right? but productivity growth is down. And there is absolutely no empirical evidence that technological change is disrupting the workplace right now as we sit here any more than it was at any time in the last 200 years. Right? Now, thirdly, the job training issue. We've systematically dismantled the job training structures that used to exist in this country. And we've largely done so in the name of labor market deregulation. And if you want to see the impact of that, you know, when we travel uh, in international labor circles, we meet with the Scandinavian unions. The Scandinavian, you want to like have some free trade advocates. The Scandinavian unions are like way out there. They love trade and they don't understand why we don't love trade. Um, and then, it, then we learn the following things, right? <laughs> we learn that um, basically there are no low wage jobs in their country. So you can't, you can't be displaced from a high wage job to a low wage job because there's no, that's not allowed. Secondly, they have comprehensive tripartite business labor government training programs. So both within the firm and across firms, people get routinely retrained. Right? It's, it's built into the structure. Neither their health care nor their retirement security are in any way impacted by the possibility of job change. Right? It's a little different in this country. Right? Uh, finally, and most importantly, and this goes to the Lordstown example, it's true that GM is moving to make electric cars, but they closed their electric car plant in the United States. I happen to know because I, I drive the car that they make in that plant. They closed their U.S. electric car plants. Now, why, why did they do that? Right? 
They have no sense, none, at, at GM. I think Ford is different, by the way, and I think it's important to recognize that different firms in this country approach these issues very differently. GM doesn't view itself as in any way territorially attached anymore. Right? Ford does. By the way, Cummins Engine does. There are, there, are, there are people with really different strategies. But in Scandinavia and in Germany, there is a very clear sense, and it's a kind of mercantilist sense, there's a very clear sense that there is a partnership between business, lab between business labor, and government to drive competitiveness and uh, essentially global market share for their firms, and, and the reward for, the, for workers in those countries will be good jobs and a fair share in what is gained. They, as th those countries operate kind of as firms. That's why their unions are, are very pro-free trade because they view free trade essentially the way that the, uh, the Ford workers did that, that Fred dealt with. They view free trade as our export strategy. Right? Now, um, I, you're, I think you're right, and we are an outlier to the rest of the world, right. not just Scandinavia. I mean, well, the Germans and the Chinese are playing that game, Fred, as your table shows. The, the, um, the understanding that we don't have the accounting right the, the, the table on, on who runs net trade surpluses in manufactured goods, so Germany and China at the top. When I met with the German Environment Ministry last fall to talk about climate change, you know what the first thing they said was? Well, we have it easy because the, our trade surplus gives us the space to be able to do the investments in, cli in, the, in the new climate technology that, uh, that we need to make. You don't have that space. Now, they may be wrong. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> right, but that's <laughs> what they... Nonsensical statement. <laughs> well, nonsensical, but that's what they believe. But so you're... Let me, but so, again, I'm sorry, I, I got to I mean, I don't think it's... Yeah, not, yeah. By the way, I don't real, think it's real, nonsensical. I got to respond to this. Yeah, real yeah. wages uh, in Germany have been approximately zero for the last decade. The reason Germany runs a large trade surplus is because subsequent to the Hartz reforms in the early 2000s, they significantly deregulated their labor market, and all those great jobs are increasingly not representative of the kinds actually, of jobs being created uh, in Germany. Actually, Greg, that's so not, they, that's they enjoy not true. a dramatic relative would, improvement in unit labor costs versus the rest of the Eurozone. Manufacturing wages went up, service sector wages went down. The Hartz reforms were for service sector employees, they bifurcated their labor market and messed up their politics, but, but their, their manufacturing wages are 130% of ours, and, they're, and they clean our clocks in, high, in, 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 um, in highly sophisticated stuff, which is why they have an effective alliance with China. Because when, 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 when China grows on the production side, they buy their machine tools from Germany and they pay their people significantly more than we do, and they have a full suite of but benefits. But Germany, by, by, by virtue of being part of the Eurozone, a zone which Absolutely. is on average much weaker, has enjoyed a significant real depreciation in its exchange rate. It is not unlike what China achieved, only through a much more capital controls driven yeah, method. Absolutely. And I think True. that you cannot talk about the German trade surplus, including in manufacturing goods, where it has competitive advantage independent of those very important markets. Oh, yeah, but if that's, the, that's the point. Mark, it would be two to the dollar versus <laughs> a dollar ten. Also, right? But, but that's the it, point. But it, it does also <laughs> importantly go back to the right. training point, right? Because if you're saying, look, the way Germany deals with this is, is it now has a bifurcated labor market where some people, some uh, working class people have really high wages, others don't. That doesn't seem like a model that you would want to... No, and in fact, it's been... I, the, the Germany is, and I, I think Greg and I agree on this. Germany is a complicated story, right? And there, and the the disaggregation of their labor market that was that was done by the Hartz reforms is the underlying reason for the deterioration of their political system. If if you, in, I mean, if you talk to anybody in the SPD, they will tell you that right? it, it it was they felt they you know they had their reasons for doing it. It 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 undercut fundamental social solidarity in the society. The, but <laughs> I think the point, though, here is that Germany is engaged in, perhaps it's ill, perhaps it's, self, perhaps it's irresponsible, perhaps it's destructive to the global system, but Germany is engaged in very strategic behavior in global markets, as is China. This, I think, comes back to your point earlier about how you, know, you, you think that Trump's has the wrong, Trump has the wrong ideas, but the Chinese share them. right? Uh, if everybody in the game is playing, if we're playing one game and other people are, and everybody else on the field is playing a different game, right? Um, 
we may want to think about our level of confidence that we're playing the right game and they're playing the wrong game. At, it a, doesn't at a certain like, point. But it, it doesn't sound like that's a fair or to I think, I think was, <laughs> You're saying Germany is doing the same thing the U.S. is doing now, and Scandinavia is doing something different, which is basically supporting well, free trade across the board, and the country that's doing best for its workers is, are the Scandinavian ones. But it sounds like... We're, well, no, look, what, what I'm saying is that, I mean, Germany, Germany has a number of the features that the Scandinavian... Germany, Germany's economy and society have a number of the features that the Scandinavian economies do. They, in the Hartz reforms, they did something the Scandinavians did not do, which was to sort of bifurcate the levels of, level of social solidarity and labor market support between the service sector and the manufacturing sector. The Scandinavians haven't done that. The, the, compared to the United States, all of these countries um, have far more of this kind of collaborative approach to the way their society faces global markets than we do. And as a result, it's just a fact that their, their labor movements are much more pro, sort of pro-free trade in the conventional sense than, than, than the American labor movement is, or, the, or than in, broad, in a broad sense, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working class people in the United States are. It, it's, a different, it's, it's a different deal. Now, by the way, if you start talking about immigration and freedom of movement, then you're having a different conversation. But I think you're also talking about one thing that I certainly saw firsthand at Export Input Bank. I remember being at a meeting, it was in Toronto, and we were talking about national champions, and I said, well, we have no national champions in the United States, and literally the meeting stopped, and the other G7 countries looked at me and said, how is that possible? Because in Germany and in Japan... They didn't say what about Boeing? Yes, they didn't say Boeing. <laughs> they didn't say what about Boeing. They left me alone about Boeing. And, you know, Qualcomm. we used to have McDonnell Douglas in Boeing, you know? But... We don't, we haven't really had, and even Boeing, it doesn't hold a candle to the German support of Siemens or Japanese and Mitsubishi and Toyota. So it's not so the channel, Tim Carney. You know, so. um, yes, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, that, that does, I think that's actually, when people look at our, how we approach a trade agreement, because we aren't going to the table saying, okay, how do we make, get the most for Mitsubishi or Siemens as part of any trade deal? We're looking at it. We sort of feel American companies should operate on their own, compete on a level playing field. So I think we have a, I think we approach it a little more hands off, and so some can say, well, see, we got a bad deal because we didn't really find, keep tilting it in a, in a particular company's direction. So, so let, let do. Yeah. So let's uh, finish up this round of talk about adjustment, then we go to Q and A. So I think to summarize, uh, uh, there's going to be much less disruption in the future. Um, because no one is changing jobs. The China <laughs> shock is over. Uh, no, that's not reason. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I'm trying to create a consensus here. But let's take some questions from the, uh, from the audience. Um, please uh, raise your hand if you want to ask a question. And when I point at you, wait for the mic. And when you receive the mic, uh, say your name, affiliation, and a question that ends in a question mark, and then we can uh, ask the panelists for their thoughts. Let's go over here in the back uh, first. Yeah, this Hi, Jacob James Rich from Reason Foundation. I'm not a fan of tariffs and most sort of barriers in trade, but if we look at a country like China, they legitimately have millions of people in concentration camps. And I'm just curious about what our reaction should be to that. Many of these people are um, being compelled to do slave labor, and that's probably producing many of our products. So how do we address that? Um, who wants to? I'd be happy to. I mean, uh, did you say you were with the, the Reason Foundation, right? So, um, look, I, we think, the AFL-CIO thinks it is a real, we are not in favor of, like, concentration camps. We're not in favor of concentration camps, let's get that clear. Uh, uh -huh. We're not in favor of, of severing our trade relationship with China. We, we are in favor of having a productive trade relationship with China, not a relationship of conflict with China, right? So, I, and I want to be clear about that because what I'm now going to say is going to sound a little harsh, all right? Um, it looked to us 10 years ago that China was going through some level of genuine opening in terms of human rights and labor rights, and that there was an opportunity to engage with China productively. And we tried very hard. Since uh, Xi has come into power, 
the door has slammed shut very hard. We can't even find the people that we talk to. Right? And I don't know which camp they're in and what you call it, right? But the, but the, the level of repression from the perspective of working people in China is shocking. Right? And, and we're not even then getting to the Uyghur situation and what, what may be the largest kind of industrial human rights violation since the Second World War. Right? I mean, there have been a lot of horrible things since the Second World War, but there's, there's a particular quality to what's happened to the Uyghurs that's really, that's really deeply, deeply disturbing. So it, it is, and one of, our view, one of our concerns about the Trump administration's dealings with China is that this set of issues has not been really fully dealt with. Right? That there's been a lot of attention to intellectual property, not so much attention to the question of whether workers have any rights at all. Right? If, you, if you look at, for example, the discourse with Mexico, right, where Lighthizer was very serious about, about labor rights, we think that kind of discourse needs to be brought to, to China. The problem is, honestly, that the Chinese perceive bringing that discourse to them as a fundamental threat to their state. They see that, they see that as a stalking horse for you know, regime change. Right? And then you get into the question that Stan is raising of like how far, what, what level of, in, what, what level of, of quote interference is, a, is appropriate. We can't, we cannot have a trade, if, if we have the kind of integra economic integration that we have with China, and China is in, engaged in massive human rights violations that affect, that affect workers' ability to negotiate, bargain, we're kidding ourselves that we ourselves at that point really have in any sense a free society that respects workers' rights. I would just add, I think, we, I think what we need to do is recruit we have sort of abandoned talking about human rights and religious freedom around the world. And, you know, if we only talk about a trade deficit, a bilateral trade deficit, everything gets pushed into that funnel. And we've abandoned our traditional role of talking about human rights and about sort of the dignity of people. And I think partly we need to do was, you know, when I was thinking when listening to about the Uyghurs, we need to find other we need to find other Muslim countries to begin, that are developing countries to criticize China because that they care about. They can dismiss us somewhat, but they actually care about their role in the developing world. And if the developing world is critical, I think that would have an impact. And if, if you don't mind my adding here, this goes to this, this issue of multilateralism. The, 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 the administration's sort of obsessive focus on unilateral approaches to international problems is really destructive. Um, and the, the weakening of multilateral organizations of all kinds is really destructive. And this is something that uh, President Trump Ka of the AFL-CIO <laughs> has been quite vocal about in a lot of settings. We, may not, we don't necessarily like what multilateral organizations do. Like We're not great fans of the IMF's policies over the years. Right. But, but multilateral organizations are the... Uh, are what, are what hope we have for civilization, as a, for global civilization. The alternative is not, not to be, is, is a, yeah. you don't want to think about it. No, you have right? to build a coalition yeah. of the willing. Right, exactly. And, and I would just say that like, the Trump administration has tried to basically segregate the human rights and national security stuff from the trade stuff. And in that sense, they're not that unusual. In fact, I think that American presidents have always been very kind of like sober and realistic about the limits to how much they can change China. Uh, it was like within months of the Tiananmen Square massacre that the George W. Bush administration was basically telling the Chinese, it's okay, everything's going to be fine. We're going to, you know, we're going to let that get in the way of, you know, rapprochement and, and, and commercial ties. Uh, it's a different matter, though, with some small countries, because with smaller countries, the United States has and does have the leverage to actually aff affect change there. And the ability to put stronger environmental labor uh, um, provisions into this version of USMCA because we had that leverage over Mexico as a perfect example. Another was with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. As one of the conditions of Vietnam being admitted in the TPP, they had to allow independent trade unions. I don't actually know whether as a practical matter how important that would have been, but that was leverage we had over Vietnam that we would never have over mm -hmm. China. So I think it's a bit of a pity that we have elected to sort of like walk away to, to, to not utilize the leverage that we have in those uh, particular situations. It's interesting to watch how public opinion toward China has changed over the course of the last 15 years. Attitudes today are almost as negative as they were immediately after Tiananmen. And that's one of the reasons that Trump has been successful in 
uh, talking about China in the way he has been. Okay, let's take another question over here. To extend on this question, uh, which countries do you think have the largest leverage on China, like the developing countries, and why? Which countries have the the, uh, the largest leverage, leverage on China? On China. Okay. This was to your point, Fred. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, if you even think about the BRICS, if you think about Brazil, certainly could, India, less so, but I think, you know, China wants, with Belt and Road and wanting to sell products and services and sort of sees the developing world as sort of up for grabs, so to speak. So I think that if they got some criticism from those countries, um, it, I'm trying to, you know, it's not perfect, but I'm trying to find out where, yeah. where there's leverage. And... Um, I doubt Bolsonaro is going to... Right, no, he's not. I, I'm talking about a country... Modi not, is definitely not going to no, complain I'm talking about countries, not Muslim leaders. Uh, and, raids you know, and uh, yeah. what, what you said earlier, I mean, the fact is... You know, a lot of the rest of the world has often let us deal with China, and they were in our wake, and they took advantage of it. You know, uh, I remember when I was working on the book, I visited the uh, war rooms where Churchill conducted World War II under Whitehall Street, and this obviously filled of Churchill quotes. And one of the ones I snapped with my iPhone and it says, "You know, the only thing work worse than working with allies is working without allies." <laughs> so. You know, yes, it's really hard to do multilateral things and at the G20 and to try and get everybody together. Those what? are really slow and then they don't, they don't make, they aren't great for a great press release or saying I reduced the trade deficit with China by $100 billion, whatever. But they tend to be more long lasting. You know, I make the analogy, if the four of us have to decide where we're going to have lunch and what time and where, it could take a long time. If one person can just call the shots, we're going to eat here, we're going at this time, whether you like it or not, we'll all have lunch, but you may have four unhappy people. <laughs> and I, so I think that our unilateral approach does run that risk. Greg, do you want to talk a bit about the current situation at the WTO? The yeah, so I would say that the only country that has any leverage over China is the United States, and we don't have very much leverage, <laughs> which is why I believe that the biggest missed opportunity of this administration thus far is not to actually work with the one amazing asset we have, which is our allies. I mean, right. Hank Paulson tells a story of one of his counterparts in China would say to him, Hank, you don't understand, you guys have all the good allies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who does China have? Cambodia, North Korea? Okay. No. And so that is a, basically an underused asset. Now, the United States will correctly say that our allies are actually, you know, they're kind of always, you know, hiding behind our skirts. I mean, it's no coincidence that the United States brings much tougher cases of the WTO than other countries do, because other countries are really terrified that China will there, therefore retaliate. retaliate against them or their companies. And so the logical thing is that the United States really wants to multiply its powers to work with allies. A good example was when China started restricting exports of rare earths, which are vital for the iPhones and uh, a lot of other um, technological products. Uh, the United States, the European Union, Canada, South Korea, and Japan brought a combined WTO case against China. And three years later, WTO ruled for them, and China was forced to like lift those controls. The United States has a legit, this administration has a legitimate complaint that WTO moves way too slowly, that should not have taken three years, mm -hmm. that the WTO dispute settlement mechanism has turned itself into basically a Supreme Court of Trade that is trying to basically m manufacture jurisprudence where it doesn't belong. But I think that the administration has yet to demonstrate that it has an alternative vision for the WTO that its allies can sign on with. I'm really hoping that we'll see that sometime in the next six to 12 months, because I think there lies the greatest potential for getting the world uh, in some kind of positive, sort of like cooperative framework for dealing with the challenge of China. I agree. I just think that this administration is so opposed to the WTO. And frankly, President Obama wasn't that keen on the WTO either. Yeah. So to close out, um, Greg mentioned earlier that in the betting markets, it looks as if President Trump is a favorite to win a second term, but obviously uh, there's a reasonable chance that whoever the Democratic nominee will become, uh, will, will be, will become president. Um, do you guys have thoughts on how, uh, what changes a Democratic president would make uh, on trade policy, which of course, as we, as we have learned, is an area where the president has almost a complete discretion? Uh, the, and, and how big do you think the differences are between the different Democratic uh, uh, candidates as well? Something I, if 
if any of you had thought on this. Yeah. So uh, just the AFL-CIO is neutral in the Democratic primary. We, we've not endorsed anybody. And so I'm going to try to talk about this for a second without reference to names. Okay. <laughs> right? um, yeah, you can say senator from Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there are, uh, you know, well, actually, I will talk about names. I mean, Bernie Sanders, because Bernie Sanders, there's no other way to do this. Bernie Sanders is supposed the USMCA. Right? And uh, so, you know, there's a difference in opinion between us and him about that. Um, uh, the, most of the other Democrats, uh, I think, all supported it mm -hmm. uh, with varying degrees of enthusiasm and caveats and so forth. I, I think there is a, an important thing to keep an eye on here, and that's the changing, there's a changing political economy around this stuff. Um, one of the things that a lot of people who were in Davos noted was the rising discourse around a bipolar world, right? which is bipolar meaning us and China. This is to Greg's point that the only, we, we each are the only people with leverage on each other. The under, I'm going to come back to the Democratic candidates and you'll see how, where this leads. The underlying, the underlying reason for the bipolarity in these is not the fact that we're the two largest countries by economy, nor that we are arguably the first and second military powers. It had to do with tech. That the United States and China are the two national homes of comprehensive tech platforms, and there aren't any others. The tech community, which is an important player in the Democratic Party, is gradually figuring out that they need the state. And that, because the Chinese tech community, they have their state. That means that, that the distance in trade policy between the corporate wing of the Democratic Party and the labor wing of the Democratic Party may turn out in future not to be as great as it has in the past. That being said, there are clearly candidates who, there are clearly Democratic candidates who are critical of what they, the Washington consensus on trade and whose positions on trade are closer to that of the labor movements. And there are clearly candidates who would pick up where Mike Froman left off. Right? And that is going to be a big deal when one thinks about Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, which is, after all, wh where, this, where the last election was decided and likely to be where the next election is decided as well. Uh, anyone else? Strong views? I, I just thought that was a, ter a terrific exactly. uh, insight exactly. that you, you just okay. made. I think the, the divisions there are, are really important. Um, when I look at, I'd say that when I look at the democratic field, I think at one of the debates they were asked, would any of you lift the tariffs on China? And none of them raised their hand. So this is not your father's democratic party. This is not, it's not even Barack Obama. I know that during the um, uh, Recovery Act uh, debate, um, there was a lot of pressure from some senators and some from governors to put very strong buy in America provisions for all those things. And Larry Summers uh, ensured that the legislation said so long as it was consistent with WTO rules. There won't be anybody in a, uh, definitely not in the Sanders administration, and I'm pretty sure not even in a Biden administration, there won't be a Larry Summers saying that. I don't think they fundamentally themselves believe that to the extent that previous Democratic presidents do, and I think the world around them has changed. So I don't think that you will see perhaps the somewhat impulsive and, in my view, um, uh, counterproductive things that like we've seen on 232 tariffs against Canada and Mexico, which even AFL-CIO yeah, we, we, we opposed. Yeah. yeah, we won't see that sort of stuff. But I think that y we're not going back to the Mike Froman world, you know, where globalization was in and of itself the point. All right, well, on that uh, uh, depressing note, very different from the tone of your book, uh, Fred, I think. So you have uh, to read the book, or, the, or as, as Norm said, just buy the book. You don't yeah, have that's to read right. The yeah, that's the, yeah, so make sure to buy the book. No need to read it. Uh, but write a review on Amazon regardless. Uh, thank you, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, thanks to our panelists. Uh, Carolyn, thank you for stepping in. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. That was great.